Hey, it's good to be home with you guys. I was gone last week preaching last weekend up at Calvary Chapel of San Jose, so they send their love to you guys. uh, The Lord is blessing their socks off as a church, but uh, Santa Clara County still will not drop the litigation. We don't know what foot they're going to try to stand on because of the Supreme Court decision that set us free in the state of California. Woo-hoo! Unprecedented. Really, really spectacular. But if you know anything about uh, Santa Clara County, it is the least church place in America. Only 3% of people have any kind of church affiliation in Santa Clara uh, County. So is it any wonder that no matter what the Supreme Court says, they're trying to pivot and come after the church in some other way. They are determined to punish them for worshiping Jesus on Sunday mornings. They are absolutely determined. So when we pray, we're going to be praying for the saints up there in San Jose as they continue through that period of time. And as Isaac said, we have, uh, as we're establishing, we've been going now a couple of months on Saturday nights, and so we want to encourage people that want to serve the Lord somehow with ushers, greeters, a security team, or with our once a month dinner for hospitality. That would be just a tremendous blessing. But we are reading through Anchored in the Word. If you haven't picked up a pamphlet or following along online, uh, somebody just did a thing to put it together so that when you click on it online, it comes up and all the daily reading is right there. You used to have to go to the different passages. So what a blessing for the technical people in our church. But we are now in the book of Acts. And so you want to make your way to the book of Acts chapter 1 for our message And if you need a Bible, just raise your hand. Linda and Dewey are going to hand out some Bibles. Just raise your hand if you need a Bible. And we're going to talk about power. Because the thing is, is that the book of Acts is about power to transform a life, power to transform a marriage, power to transform a community. And it's all about the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Now, we need power for everything we do, right? My cell phone, it uh, starts blinking and telling me, hey, I'm, I'm uh, at 10%. And my computer and my AirPods, everything I have is plugged into power so that the batteries get charged up so that I can use it for the day. And I come from a place in Idaho that has some of the cheapest power in America because in Idaho Falls, they have their own dam for their city. So we had hydropower and uh, it was incredibly inexpensive. And uh, Idaho Power, which is another uh, company, they're just incredibly cheap power. And then I came here. There was another power company in Idaho that had this one section, and if you were unfortunate enough to live in that section, we called them uh, Utah uh, Pillage and Lights, and they're uh, just, you know, it's unbelievable how much more expensive it was there. And here you guys don't even have enough power when it's hot out for air conditioning, right? You have to have rolling blackouts because people wanting to go with green power are shutting down your power plants. Now, how are you going to have enough power, wind power, solar power, for 40 million Americans? But they're geniuses here in your state, and they'll figure it out, right? And yet, the reality is is that everything in your modern convenience is connected to power. You had power, horsepower, when you came here. Isn't it funny that they used to measure power by a horse? This is how much one horse, two horse, three horse. And now, hey, what's that new Camaro have in it? The, the Super Hootie won uh, 750 horsepower. Right? We still measure things in horsepower that things begin to build on. Just like with a lumen for a candle, they, they measure light bulbs from a candle. How many candle light, you know, the lumens of it. You and I are in desperate need of supernatural power in our life. And from the power plant comes the transmission lines. That's me with the cool yellow gloves up there. Right, And we want to plug into power in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. And we're going to be plugging into this passage of Scripture. And God's Spirit wants to do a special work in each one of you. You know, we were talking about there's nothing better than you about Jesus. 
There's nothing better than the Lord. But the Christian teaching, Jesus' perfect example and all of his instruction for the apostles would have been worthless if he would not have given the power to live it out. Your life, the Christian life, is a supernatural life that is impossible to be lived apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. It is impossible. And if you feel dead in the water, if you feel shriveled up, if you feel dried up, if you feel like you're hanging on by a thread, God's power and spirit wants to refresh you and strengthen you so that you can live this transformed life as a Christian. Let's stand together and read this passage of scripture as we look at plugged into power. Tells us in verse one, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his, after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons, which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth." Father, we ask that as your word goes forth, that you would fill us with your power, that you would open our eyes, that you would be the one that teaches us and instructs us to be able to tap in and plug in to your supernatural power by faith. And we ask it in Jesus' name. We also, Lord, pray for the saints up in San Jose, that you would comfort them, strengthen them, support them, deliver them from the tyranny up there, Lord, by your grace. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. There are three thoughts that I want to share with you from this passage of Scripture. I want to share with you the promise of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit, and the parameters of the Spirit. All laid out here in this passage of Scripture as Jesus is letting them know that they need to wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. They were waiting in Jerusalem. Why were they waiting in Jerusalem until Pentecost? Now, he had been revealing himself for 40 days. He's showing up, coming through walls, startling them, shocking them, revealing himself to them so that they were very aware of his resurrection life. As a matter of fact, uh, Paul the Apostle tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that Jesus even appeared to 500 people at one time. And he said at that time, most of those were still alive when he wrote to the Corinthians. Jesus revealed his resurrection life and power, and yet he tells the disciples they need another 10 days to get to Pentecost until the Holy Spirit's going to be poured out. You see, it's very specific. Jesus came at Passover to be the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Amen? And then he wanted the church's birthday, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, to be upon Pentecost, which was first fruits, or harvest. So when Peter preaches in chapter 2 of the book of Acts, 3,000 souls were saved, and the church was birthed and born upon an Old Testament feast day with a specific purpose to fulfill the prophecies of Scripture. And with this, the promise of the Father, Jesus had been talking to them over and over and over about this promised one, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now, as we look at this promise of the Father, as we saw in verse 4, we want to look at the passages that Jesus was promising them he was going to come. In John 14, verse 16 and 18, he says, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. 
He said, I'm going to give you another helper. Now, that Greek word another means one of the same quality. Yeah, now, just imagine, you've been hanging out with Jesus, the Savior of the world, <laughs> for three and a half years, and everything you need, he does for you, right? We're hungry. He <laughs> says, well, let's multiply the loaves and the fish, right? We got five loaves, two fish. Let's feed 5,000 people. No big deal. Jesus is here. Peter and Jesus have to pay taxes. Jesus says, well, Peter, go down, go fishing. The first fish you catch, you're going to open the mouth, and there's the money right in the fish's mouth. I mean, it's a good thing, right? You're hanging out with the Lord, and he's taking Peter's after church one day, after synagogue. Jesus and Peter go over to his house to have some lunch, and there's his Jewish mother-in-law on the couch. She's sick. Jesus touches her and heals her, and she gets up and immediately, you know, starts making a falafel. Right? I mean, it's, it's perfect. Jesus is with you. So the comfort when you're terrified and you're afraid and you're in a storm, Jesus can say, be still. And the wa waves stop. The wind ceases. And they're like, holy cow, who's in the boat with us? You've been fishing all night. You catch nothing. Jesus says your real problem is you're not fishing out the right side of the boat. Right? Throw the net to the other side and your nets will be breaking. Imagine now Jesus says he's going to leave you after three and a half years of that goodness. What? Please don't. But he says, I'm going to send someone, not a power, not a force, not an it, the third person of the Trinity, I'm going to send another helper, another comforter. The word literally in the Greek is paraclete. It means the one that comes alongside and comforts you, that helps you, that encourages you. And don't you need that? You need that comfort, you need that encouragement, you need that help, I need that help. And Jesus said, I'm going to bring somebody along that's just exactly like me. As a matter of fact, in one passage, he's called the Spirit of Christ. He fully reveals who Jesus is to you and I. And I need that supernatural help. He says, I'll not leave you orphans. Because the apostles felt like they were being orphaned when Jesus died on the cross. Like, our Savior's gone, what are we going to do now? And you see... The Lord wants to comfort you in your loneliness. The most important dimension of human loneliness is a loneliness for God. You can go through your whole life and you're having relationships with all of these humans, but there's something still dead inside of you that you cannot grasp or touch. Jesus also promised about the Father in John 15, 26, in 27, he says, when the helper comes, he will testify of me. When the Holy Spirit comes, he's always pointing people to Jesus. Jesus is the hero of the story. The Holy Spirit's always inspiring people to look at Jesus. That's what his ministry is. And sometimes I, I get a kick out, out of my Pentecostal brothers and sisters because all they want to talk about is the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. And I'm like, cool, I can do that too. You just got to go to the right classes and be in the right spot. No offense if you come from a Pentecostal background. Glory. God bless you. But the thing is, there's sometimes an overemphasis on the Holy Spirit to the detriment that the Holy Spirit's always wanting to talk about Jesus. Talk about Jesus. Talk about Jesus. Talk about Jesus. This honors the Father that every tongue should confess and every knee bow that Jesus Christ, and declare Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. This pleases the Father. It pleases the Spirit. And this is what the Spirit's going to do. He tells us in John 16, 13, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit is going to teach you and lead you and me into truth. He tells us a radical thing that the Holy Spirit, this is how he's going to convert the world in John 16, 18. 8 through 11, it says, when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Sin because they do not believe me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. What's the Holy Spirit going to do? Now, wait a second. What's that? When the Holy Spirit shows up in your life, what is he communicating to you? What is he drawing you to do? He's saying, first of all, he convicts. That means to bring a strong piercing of the soul that you realize your sin. And he says, people, when they, they're touched by the Spirit, they're convicted. Their soul is pierced because they know they don't believe in Jesus. So his goal, the Holy Spirit, is to convict you of that. 
like Peter when he preached, and it says the people, the men were cut to the heart, and they said, what shall we do? And he said, believe in Jesus. So faith is the answer to that conviction. And then he says of righteousness, because I go to my father and you, you see me no more. What he means is this is the righteous standard God will receive into heaven. Only Jesus' per- perfect death, burial, and resurrection, his perfect sinless life is the only way to have a righteous standing with God. That's what the Holy Spirit reveals to us. And thirdly, of judgment. Not your judgment or somebody else's judgment, that the devil has been judged. The ruler of this world has been judged. Colossians tells us, as Paul the Apostle writes, he says that Jesus took all of the handwriting of all the sin of your life and my life. Think of it. I mean, I know some of us. You got like an encyclopedia of sin, right? And Jesus drives a spike right through all of the handwriting that has been recording all of your failure, and he nailed it to the cross. It's dead. Isn't that great news? Right, there's, there's nothing, there's no, no, no handwriting, there's no charges against you that Jesus didn't nail to the cross and you stand now whole and blameless and righteous in his sight, forgiven. So this is what the Holy Spirit does and is this not what our heart needs? Because the devil's the accuser of the brethren but Jesus, the Holy Spirit wants to reveal to you, I've judged him, he's toast. He has no power over you any longer. And then he tells us in Acts chapter 2, verse 39, the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off. This promise of the Spirit is for everyone. You see, this beautiful reality about the promise of the Spirit now is going to be fully realized in Acts chapter 2, where Paul the Apostle is going to... uh, ultimately be exposed, excuse me, Peter the Apostle is going to be filled with the Spirit and preaching. A guy that would deny the Lord three times when a little servant girl gave him a hard time about being a follower of Jesus. Now, according to tradition, Peter was a big, rugged guy. As a matter of fact, it says that he hauled 153 large fish in a net, in the mud, in the water, up on shore. This dude's a horse. And yet a little girl's like, you know Jesus, and he's denying that he knows him. That same guy, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, could preach to 3,000 fearlessly. Well, 3,000 got saved, so there were many more thousand than that. Now we want to look at, secondly, at the power of the Spirit. So if those are the promises, and all those promises now are being fulfilled for the apostles and available for you and I today. We see the power of the Spirit as it says in verse eight, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You see, Acts chapter two, verse one through four, it says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and there were, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Genesis 1-2 says the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The same Spirit that's working in all of these people's lives through the Old Testament. In Genesis 1-2, we see the Holy Spirit on the scene. He's hovering over the face of the waters. That's what the Spirit's doing. What does that mean? It means his creative power is involved with the Father and the Son and the Spirit in creating this incredible creation according to Genesis 1 and 2 in 6 amazing days. Now, if the Spirit is a part of that work, and now He's hovering over your life, His creative power is coming to your life, His help is coming to you, His comfort is coming to you, His encouragement is coming to you, if He can create as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in this incredible triunity created the heavens and the earth, can He do a work in your messed up life? Right? Can He help you out? It says before that, and the earth was without form and void. That would describe some of us tonight, (laughs) right? Without form and void. I just feel kind of nebulous, like I don't have any direction. I don't know what I'm doing with my life. I'm, I'm lost. I'm upside down. I'm an emotional mess, right? The spirit is working. And yet when Pentecost had fully come, there was the sound of a mighty rushing wind. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, the spirit is... In the New Testament, the Greek word is pneuma. We get the word pneumatic tools from that. In the Old Testament, it's ruach. 
But it's both this idea of breath filling something, breath breathing into you, breathing life into you. And so this empowering that was going to come to them, what kind of power is it? It says you'll receive power. This power is dynamic power. Power because you see it's dunamis. That's what the Greek word is. It's dunamis, where we get our word, that's a dynamic individual. Or dynamite, that's an explosive situation. It means power to be able or capable to achieve something. It is the power to live the Christian life. It is a power specifically in this passage of Scripture to be a witness. Now, there are three prepositions that are key for you to understand in your relationship with the Holy Spirit. Once again, the Holy Spirit is not an it. He's not a force. Because when you think of the Father, you think of a Father. When you think of the Son, you think of a Son. But you think of the Spirit and people just go, I don't know what to think. But the Bible says that you can lie to the Spirit, you can resist the Spirit, you can grieve the Spirit. He is the person of the Holy Spirit just like you and I are, and yet through the representation of spirit and not a dynamic of a father or a son. They're in perfect unity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in their essence. Essence is the, the dominant quality of any individual or thing, any person or thing. And their dominant quality is they are all deity. They are all God. And this power comes... And it says, these three prepositions are, he will be with you, he will be in you, and he'll be upon you. These three. The Greek for that is, with you is para, in you is en, and upon you is ep. You see, it says in John 14, 17, for he who dwell, he dwells with you, para, and he will be in you. You remember when you got saved? It seemed like God was working in your life, but you didn't even know it was God. And then you receive Jesus, and you're like, oh, I look back over the last three or four months, and Jesus has been knocking on the door of my heart. That's what happened to me. I didn't realize, I, I was wondering what was wrong with me. I was having this new conviction, and I started thinking about things that I had never thought about before. And it was the Holy Spirit was with me to draw me to the Father through the Son. And then when I received Jesus, then he came into me just like he came inside of you. And we are sealed for the day of redemption, as it tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. But he's also now going to come upon you. So if the Holy Spirit's with you, he was beside you, then you receive him, he comes inside of you, then he comes upon you to empower you now for service. When he's with you, he's drawing you to salvation. When you believe in Jesus, you are now saved. You're a saved individual. When he comes upon you, it's to empower you to be useful for God to be filled with his power so that you can specifically, as we see, the power has a purpose, and the purpose of the power is to be a witness. But before you move on from that thought, just wrap your head around this. The God of the universe that sent his son to die for you and Jesus rose from the dead and sent the spirit to fill you and I now lives inside of each one of us, and we are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. As it says in 1 Corinthians 19 and 20, it says, Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Isn't it mind-blowing that, you see, church, this is just a building. When you guys leave, this is a structure. You guys could say, hey, let's go to the structure tonight so that we can hang out with the church. Because this is not a church until you show up. This is, not, this is not a temple. It's not, that God doesn't dwell here in the sheetrock. God dwells inside of you. And so when you guys show up, hey, let's have some church. Two or three of us, it's good because a lot of times we have a prayer meeting. That's all we have, two or three. They showed up. We're going to have church. The Holy Spirit's inside of us, and this is one of the most beautiful personal verses. It's one of my favorite in John 14. It says this in verse 23. If anyone loves me, do you love Jesus? And he, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He's going to come move inside. 
It's moving day. The day you believe in Jesus is just the Father and the Son and the presence of the Holy Spirit moves inside of you to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that's mind-blowing. That's why we can grieve the Spirit. Because can you imagine anyone else having to live in this carcass of ours like you and me? Right? I am so glad that you can't read my mind. And I definitely don't want to be able to read your mind. A couple of years ago, there was a... uh, the technology now, they can wire brains together in such a way that the technology is almost there so that if you're wired together in your mind, you can know each other's thoughts. Isn't that the freakiest thing ever? Who would want that? (laughs) Right? Who would want other people to actually know what bounces around up here in your noggin? Not me, for sure. But it says that the Lord is going to come and make his home with us. You know, no matter where I'm at, I'm never alone. I'm never an orphan. He will never leave me or forsake me. He is always, always, always with me. Well, this thought of being a witness, and you shall be witnesses to me. The word witness means martyr. We immediately think of a martyr as somebody that has died for their faith, right? That's, That's what a martyr is. But the Greek word here for martyr is witness. A martyr is a witness, and sometimes your witness is so powerful, somebody kills you for it. (laughs) That's what happened to Stephen, right? Stephen preaches in Acts chapter 7, and then they, they were so angry at him that they tore their clothes, they gnashed at him with their teeth, and they stoned him to death because he was a witness about who Jesus is. Now, a witness is, is a very simple thing, you guys. Get into this thing where they say, let's go witnessing. Witnessing is just who you are. It's not what you do. If I saw a car wreck and the police officer asked me, hey, were you an eyewitness to that car wreck? I'll say, yeah, I was here. I watched what happened. I'll tell you what I saw. Right? If I'm a witness to anything, I just communicate what I saw, what I observed, what I experienced. And that's all you have to do as a Christian. All you have to do is share, this is what Jesus did in my life. This is what happened in my life. And you share that witness. It's not some, I don't know enough Bible verses. I don't know apologetics. I don't have the answers for the universe. Just share with people as a witness, what has Jesus done in your life? This is what my life looked like. Jesus came into my life. This is what my life looks like now. Done. It's like the blind man. He said, I was blind. This is all I know. I was blind. Now I see. He's a great witness, right? Short, concise, to the point. No long deliberation. So when we are being a witness, when we are simply sharing with other people about what God has done, this is the hardest thing, isn't it? Because I still, if I'm going to share with someone one-on-one, I get a little butterfly inside of me. How about you? You're going to tell somebody at work about Jesus, a family member, a neighbor, a friend, and you go, should I do this? Should I do it now? Should, is this a good thing? Are they going to respond well? How are they, how's it all going to go? I just want you to know, it's easier for me to preach to a thousand people than to talk to a person one-on-one. Just, just saying. So that you don't feel like you're the odd person out. It, it's one of those things that when I want to share what I've realized this, that the name of Jesus and the work of Jesus in my life divides men, divides women. People hear the name of Jesus and that he's working in your life, and some people roll their eyes. Some people go off and start cursing you. Other people go, there, there, that's nice for you. That's probably the worst, right? There, there. Sounds like you really needed Jesus. You were so bad. (laughs) But I'm good. I don't need Jesus, right? So the power to be a witness, it literally means to give you the freedom of speech through the power of heaven to tell others about the love of God. That's all it simply is. It's this power, and the purpose primarily is to be a witness of who Jesus is and what he has done in your life. After a couple of chapters in the book of Acts, when we get to chapter 4, they're threatened and they're told, don't speak in the name of Jesus anymore. So you know what the Christians did? They got together and prayed that God would give them more boldness. (laughs) They're like, they told us to shut up. We should pray and shut up. No, we should pray that God gives us more freedom of speech. It says in Acts 4.31, 
When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Are you a witness for Jesus? It has been said that if you were charged in a court of law, could enough evidence be produced to convict you of your Christian life? Would enough work, you know, family members, neighbors, co-workers, classmates stand up and come and testify about your life in Christ, your changed life, your testimony? You see, the reality is, is that our faith is to transform our personal life, but it's not to stop there. We're to be salt and light for the rest of the world, to see the love of God. Now, not only is there the purpose of the power of the Spirit, this dynamic, dunamis, supernatural power, to give us courage to be martyrs, that means just a witness. I doubt in America if you're going to die for your faith. Could happen, but unlikely. But it's also to give us the fruit of the Spirit, because what good is the witness unless he looks like this? In Galatians 5, verse 22 through 23. What does the Spirit want to produce in your life? He wants to give you courage to be a witness for Jesus, and he wants to fill you with God's love. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit, check this out. Does this describe you? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such thing, things there is no law. Who doesn't want to be around a loving, joyful peaceful, kind, patient person, right? People that are filled with God's Spirit not only have the courage to be a witness for Jesus, but God's Spirit is so changing them inside because everything about my life and my nature apart from Jesus does not look like that. How about you? I am not very loving. I'm kind of sad and mopey. I don't have a lot of peace. I'm filled with anxiety. And long-suffering specifically means to bear a long time with people that irritate you to death. Right? That's what long-suffering... When the Bible says patience, it means patience in hard circumstance. Long-suffering means you are suffering along with this guy, this girl. And you're still kind, and you're still wanting to do the good thing, and you're still faithful, and you're still gentle, and the fruit of the Spirit helps you with self-control, which is the ability to say to the right, yes to the right things and no to the wrong things, where you didn't have that power to before. Does that mark your life? Because that's the evidence the Spirit is working, that there's love, joy, and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, all those things, self-control. But not only does the Holy Spirit give us power to be a witness and to speak freely of Jesus' love for us and what he's done in our life and give us the power to be transformed and to give us loving hearts rather than selfish hearts, giving us joyful hearts rather than depressed hearts, giving us peaceful hearts rather than anxious, stressed out hearts. The Holy Spirit also gives us special gifts to be able to love and serve other people. It says in 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. See, this is the bottom line. God gives us gifts to be able to be a blessing to other people. I'm functioning in a gift as a pastor teacher here tonight to declare God's word, to bring it to your hearts so that you'll be encouraged and built up and edified and you will leave stronger, spiritually speaking, when you leave this place than when you came in. These are the gifts of the Spirit in action. There's about 19 gifts depending on how you count them. Some add two to that, you know, 21 gifts, somewhere in there, 19 to 21 gifts. But uh, and it may not be an exhaustive list of all the gifts of the Spirit, but all the gifts are for other people to be a blessing. What gifts of the Holy Spirit has God given you? Has God given you boldness to be a witness for him? Are you growing in love, joy, and peace, patience, and kindness? Are you using your gifts for God? 
Sometimes we just need a season in our life, sometimes a message, sometimes an exhortation to motivate us. It's like, you know, when you cook a pot of beans, you have to stir it on a regular basis because if you don't, they burn on the bottom, right? You got to keep it stirred up. And, and I've noticed that, that being a witness, God's love and using our gifts are kind of like that. If, we, if we're not stirred up, right, we just, we get kind of stagnant. We haven't used our, our gifts for some time. We haven't really been walking in love. We've been seriously stressed out. I had the most unusual circumstance or experience today. I'm walking down the road over by Albertsons, not far from here. And I walk down by uh, the Starbucks and Albertsons. And I'm walking down the road. And on Saturdays before I preach, I go for a prayer walk. I spend time in prayer. And I'm just talking to the Lord about my message and helping, asking him to help me with the Holy Spirit. And I'm like all by myself walking down the road. And up here on the corner at the block, there's this, looks like a dad and a daughter that's, uh, she's between 9 and 11, something like that. And she's sitting on a... Um, uh, a post thing right there by the, by the sidewalk. And, and she's the cutest little girl. She's got pink roller skates, pink uh, knee pads and elbow pads, and a pink helmet. I mean, she's decked out Barbieville from top to bottom with this pink outfit. She's just stinking adorable. And I get up there. Now, it's a, a busier road, so the noise of the cars. And as I get up there, she says something to me. And I said, uh, excuse me? Because she was sitting up high on this thing. She was almost at my eye level. So I leaned forward and I said, what was that? And she said, we're just out here today asking who we could pray for. <laughs> they said, we're out here on a prayer walk and going to see who we can pray for. And I said, I'm on a prayer walk. <laughs> and I said, what's your name? And she says, Emily. She's this little cute Emily. And then I met her dad, and his name was Augustine. And they said, we would just like to pray for you. And I said, well, this is how you can pray for me. Pray for me and the congregation. I'm going to share a message tonight at church. And they lit up. And so Emily prayed for me. And if there's anything good that comes out of this message, it's because Emily prayed for me. Just so that you know. <laughs> you know that childlike faith that Emily prayed for me. So Emily prayed for me that Jesus would help me. <laughs> and then Augustine, her dad, prayed for me. And then I prayed for the two of them that the Lord would fill them with his love and his joy and his peace. And just the goodness of God. Now, when's the last time something like that happened to you, right? Walking around, especially COVIDville. I, was, I immediately, when I was a block away, they didn't have masks. And I'm like, hallelujah, hallelujah. Like everybody, these little kids with masks, and you can't see them, and you can't talk, and they muffle when they're, you know, trying. And it was just a joy to see them without a mask, let alone they ask if they could pray for me. You think God's Spirit's working in those two? Right? They want to, they're just asking, you know how hard it is to ask a stranger, can I pray for you? Right, you're 60 years old, go stand on the sidewalk this weekend, you try that out. Now, it really helps if you've got a cute little nine-year-old in uh, pink roller skates to ask the question, let me tell you. It does. She, she, she had me. She, you had me at hello. <laughs> but the incredible reality is that the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the empowering that God has for you and I is really designed to gift us and to be functioning the way God's created you. Do you know that you are fearfully and wonderfully made and that you are God's workmanship created in Christ, in, uh, you are created in Christ Jesus under good works that God has prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. God has a plan to use your life. You know, at our apartment, just like at your home or your apartment, our house is filled with electra, uh, electronic appliances that are dead and useless without power. The refrigerator is designed to preserve food. It can't do it unless it's plugged into power. The microwave is designed to kill us all. It can't work, <laughs> right, unless you plug it into power. <laughs> the dishwasher is meant to do what the children used to do before they moved out, but you got to have power. Our stove has gas power. It still needs power to be able to cook our food. Our washer and our dryer. 
Everything, the blender in there, everything has to be plugged into power or it is, a, is simply wasting space. It's wasting space. Do you realize that people without a, a relationship with Jesus and not empowered by the Spirit, Paul the Apostle says in Ephesians chapter 2 that they're walking dead men. He said, you are dead in your sins and your trespasses. Do you remember what it was like to live the hollow, meaningless life, no matter how successful you are in the world, no matter how successful, whatever you achieved, it always left this haunting hole? It was Pascal that said, in each individual is a God-shaped void that is designed that only God can fill. And when he fills us and he empowers us, I realize Unlike a refrigerator that's meant to preserve food, I'm an individual that is empowered to love God and love the people in my life and to share the hope of Jesus and to use the gifts that God has given me for the glory of God. And I find my greatest fulfillment and I find my greatest design and the greatest meaning and purpose empowered by the Spirit to be who God wants me to be. Now the thing is, oftentimes people don't believe that. They don't. They grow up in church. Church kids are the worst, right? They grow up in church and like, you know, there's got to be something out there that's just as good as Jesus or better than Jesus or, you know, they, 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 they well, go knock yourself out, man. I, I looked really hard. Maybe you looked really hard. And maybe you had all of the world by the tail and yet you realize how empty you were, how guilty in your sins you were how haunted by anxiety you are, how terrified of eternity you are. And you came to Jesus and it transformed your life. That's why it's so important for us to put our faith in Jesus Christ and be plugged into the power and the resource of heaven so that I am connected to the Lord. And lastly, we just wrap it up quickly with the parameters of the Spirit. Is there any any limits to the empowerment God's gonna give us, to give me, to give you, that God won't go with us and to spread this message. It says that we're going to have the power to be as witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. This is an ever-widening circle, like this picture of a stone thrown into a pond, and it plunges into the water, and those ringlets go out and out and out till they reach the shores of the lake. And that's what happens when the empowering of the Holy Spirit comes into our life. It starts in my personal life. Then it begins to affect my wife. And then it begins to affect my children. It begins to affect my coworkers. It begins to affect my classmates. And what happens is it begins to grow out from there. And then pretty soon I can reach people in the community. And then pretty soon it's not just our Jerusalem, our little hometown where we're reaching. Now we have the opportunity to go over here and watch what the Lord does and go plant a church over there. And I've had the joy to go to the ends of the earth to preach the gospel in 17 different nations, different languages, different interpreters, and the thing I've discovered is the power and the presence of God are in all of those places with no limitation to geography or culture or language. God's Spirit is empowering and present in what I've discovered, that everywhere I go, people are the same. People are guilty and ashamed in their sins, whether they acknowledge it or not, and people are empty inside and they're terrified of eternity and death that's coming. This is a universal thing, no matter where you go. People are terrified to die because they don't know what's on the other side. But Jesus tells us to be absent from the body is to be present with him. What an incredible comfort, right? I tell you, you cannot fully live full tilt in a fearless way until you're ready to die. And when you know Jesus, you're, you, that great enemy of death has been removed, the last enemy. And the bondage of sin has been removed because for the first time, I'm not only forgiven, but I'm empowered to please God. So I have to realize exactly what Jesus said in John 6, It is the Spirit who gives life. The Holy Spirit will bring life to you. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Jesus is speaking to you tonight. And this is exactly what the Lord's saying. 
The spirit brings life to a soul, but the flesh profits nothing. You can run after the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and there is a temporary thrill. There is a temporary, uh, you know, it says that Moses uh, gave up the, the passing pleasures of sin. There is temporary pleasure in a woohoo in sin, right? And I heard a preacher one time say that there wasn't. I'm like, dude, you haven't sinned for a while. There is a woohoo, right? <laughs> Otherwise, it wouldn't be called temptation, right? You can't t- tempt me with something that's not a woohoo moment. I got to have some woohoo. But after the woohoo is the oh no, right? It's woohoo, and afterwards, oh, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I did that. Oh, no, I did that. I hope nobody finds out I did that. Oh, no, right? It's the woohoo to the oh, no. But the spirit brings life, and you wake up in the morning, and you're right with God. There's no oh, no. There's oh, yeah. I get to love and serve God. You have to realize this, though, that this, and, and, and many people have to be convinced of this through failure in life, that the spirit brings life, but the flesh profits nothing. It's going to add nothing to your emotional bank account to pursue whatever your heart's desire is in your flesh. It will always leave you empty and hurting. So what do we need to do? We just need to ask. That's the beautiful thing about the Spirit. Jesus told us in Luke eleven thirteen, 13, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You want to ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Believe in Jesus. Say, Lord, I love you, Jesus. Please forgive me of my sins and fill me with the Holy Spirit. It's just that simple. By faith, asking. And then you need to invest in the Spirit. Galatians 6, 8, for he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. So how do I get spiritually strong? I spend time in the word, which is the sword of the spirit. I spend time in prayer, praying in the Holy Spirit. I spend time worshiping in the spirit. I spend time with God's people. And all of these things strengthen me spiritually because I still have this old sinful nature. But if I sow to the flesh and I don't read the word and I don't pray and I don't come to church and I'm just doing my own thing and I'm pursuing the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, then it brings corruption, it brings destruction, it brings an emptiness to my soul. It's like the old Eskimo said, he became a Christian, and somebody said, what's it like being a Christian? And he said, well, it's like there's two wolves living inside of me, and they're fighting all the time. And they said, well, which one wins? He said, whichever one I feed the most. If you feed the spirit, you will be strong spiritually. If you feed the flesh, you will be weak spiritually, even as a believer. Most, no, I should say, that's the wrong term. Some believers have enough of Jesus to get to heaven, but they don't sow to the spirit, they sow to the flesh, so they're going to get in by the skin of their teeth, basically. They have enough of Jesus to get into heaven, but they don't have enough of the work of the spirit in their life to bring Jesus to earth. Do you know that it's possible to have a saved soul in a lost life? A saved soul in a lost life. So you have to invest in spiritual things because the wrestling is going to happen. In Galatians 5, 16 and 17, it says, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. The Christian life is going to struggle. You know, before I got saved, there was no struggle. You want to party, you want to drink, you want to smoke dope, you want to snort coke, you want to, get a, you want to punch that guy in the face. No restrictions, just do whatever I want. There's no wrestling match, there's no struggle, just feels good, go do it. It's the woo-hoo, oh no. That was my life. And then I got saved, and after about a month, I thought, I'm losing my mind. Because now I still had some of those inclinations, but now I want to please God. Now I, now I, I, I want to walk with Jesus. I'd go to church on Sunday morning and I would rededicate my life every week because I was living like hell all week long, right? And I was going through this wrestling match. Somebody came up to Charles Spurgeon one day and they said, Pastor, I'm really, really wrestling. He said, great. And they said, no, not great. I'm having a hard time internally. He said, I want to encourage you, dead men don't wrestle. You have resurrection life living inside of you. 
and you have an old nature, and you're going to wrestle every week. And I just want you to know I'm happy about that. Because I wrestle every single day, and why do you get a free pass if I got to wrestle every day? That makes no sense. You're going to wrestle with your old nature and your new nature, and whichever one wins the day is the one you feed the most. Spending time in word, in prayer, listening to a message, listening to worship, whatever it takes to get you into that place of fruitfulness in the Spirit. Jesus promised the disciples, you are going to have power to be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And when God's Spirit fills a life, there is transformation. Old things become new, and life is new and different. Doesn't mean there's not still a battle going on. But I want to just encourage you. God's Spirit gives us power to be a witness for Jesus to speak up for him. It brings the fruit of the spirit of love, joy, and peace into our life. And it gives us gifts. The Holy Spirit gives us gifts to use for his kingdom. And we just need to operate in that by faith. Let's pray that the Lord will fill us now and use our lives. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your incredible goodness. We can't believe that you've loved us, Jesus, and rescued us and paid the price for our sins. And we pray now, Lord, as we wrap this up, we pray that your Holy Spirit would come upon us and enable us and empower us by your grace to be useful for your kingdom. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. As the worship team is going to lead us in worship, just want to encourage you. I'm going to be hanging out up here if you need prayer for anything. Pastor Tony, after we get done with the song, come down and be available for prayer. And maybe there's just some things going on in your life. You just need God's ex an extra dose of grace tonight. We want to pray before you leave with that. Let's worship him with this closing song.